All right. Well, why don't we get started, folks? So uh, good evening, everybody, and um, uh, welcome to tonight's program. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager at Walton Library. Very happy to see you all in virtual space. Uh, tonight's program is the last standalone program of the Walton Reed series. We do have the fourth session of the poetry seminar about uh, uh, Natasha Trethewey's poetry on Thursday morning at 1030. You can still attend that if you like. Um, but uh, I just want to mention one housekeeping detail. Use the Q&A button uh, in order to submit questions. Uh, it'll, those questions will be seen by the panel and by the moderator. And uh, we'll handle them either on the fly or at the end, however it makes most sense. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, our executive director, Elaine Tyloria, for some introductory comments. Elaine. Thank you, Michael. Good evening and welcome to this evening's Wilton Reads 21 panel discussion. I'm Elaine Ty Lauria, Executive Director of Wilton Library. Wilton Library's mission is to inform, connect, enrich, and inspire our community. In keeping with these objectives, each year we invite the town to come together to read a chosen book and to discuss important topics described in that work. The goal of this annual initiative is to create an opportunity whereby we can sharpen our view of the world around us and indeed to also look inwardly at ourselves. Our ultimate goal is to foster mutual respect, empathy, and a deeper understanding and appreciation of our common humanity. Many of you have participated in other Wilton Reads initiatives, such as the Holocaust programs in 2019 and the programs about jazz in 2020. This year, the award-winning book, Memorial Drive, A Daughter's Memoir by Natasha Threthway, has been a springboard for exploring the topic of race relations in this country. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the staff of Wilton Library, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Wilton Public Schools, and our community partners, the Wilton Historical Society, for producing two excellent videos about Wilton's history in this area. I invite you to view these informative videos. Thanks also to the Wilton Interfaith Clergy for their insightful panel discussion. Thanks to our sponsors, the Fairfield County Bank, the Village Market, Wilton, Good Morning Wilton, and Charles and Alyssa Grodin and family. To our program leaders, Susan Boyer, Judson Scruton, Dr. Gil Harrell, and Megan Smith-Harris. Thanks to all of you who participated in the wide variety of programs offered and attended the author visit and interview conducted by this evening's moderator, Megan Smith-Harris. The topic of this evening's panel discussion is the anatomy of race relations and the way forward. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Megan Smith Harris. She's well known to many of us having been the editor of Wilton Magazine for several years. However, she's a lady of many talents. Megan is a film producer as well as founder and executive director of Fairfield Film of the Fairfield Film Festival. For many years, she has also generously donated her skills in moderating Wilton Library's new Perspective film series. Megan has been a wonderful library patron, supporter, and advocate, and we thank her for her loyal friendship to our library. I will now hand things over to Megan, who will introduce our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elaine. How, how nice to be highly thought of. And I love the Wilton Library. Um, it really is the heart and soul of this town. So uh, these programs are so important and they get, they're thought provoking, they get people talking, they start conversations. And that's what tonight is about. It's about starting a conversation. So I'd like to introduce each of our panelists tonight and then uh, we're gonna have quite a conversation. First, the lovely and charming Adrienne Reedy. She is a local Wilton resident. She's lived here for 24 years. 
She has been active in the conversation of what she calls racism to gracism. She's traveled the country for the past 15 years um, speaking on this theme. She's also a Wilton uh, uh, commissioner, police commissioner, and she is proud to have raised three biracial sons in the Wilton community. So Adrian, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Kelly Weldon, uh, who is also a Wilton resident, also been here 24 years and also has three children and has raised them here in this community. Um, Kelly uh, works with the uh, Foundations in Faith, the Bishop's Ad Hoc Com Committee on Racism. And she has always felt called to confront racism and wants to be involved in activities um, that help people learn and unlearn. Um, she's gonna talk more about that later. Uh, she has a whole Jenga analogy that I really want to share <laughs> with you. Um, next, we have Chris Brubeck, the man who probably needs no introduction, but because I'm a polite person, I'm going to. Uh, Chris, as everyone knows, is a lifelong musician and composer, both in jazz and classical music. Um, the Brubeck family uh, have long, long lived in, in Wilton since the 60s. Um, Chris is really a global citizen and that is what he's bringing tonight, not only his uh, storied uh, history with his family and their fight against um, uh, racism and their support of the civil rights movement, both here and abroad, um, particularly in South Africa. Um, but he, he really is a, a global citizen who believes that music uh, and culture can really bring together our shared humanity. So we'll get to that later. Chris, thank you for being here. And last but by no means least is Bill Harris, who is married to Megan Smith Harris. Um, and we have both raised a biracial son in Wilton. We've been here for, I think, 18 years on April 23rd. Bill is a former television producer, uh, I mean, executive. He has uh, worked for every television network. He worked for the A&E television network for 16 years. He's a film producer. He's a professor um, at Sacred Heart University in the master's program for film and television media arts. Uh, he is also the director of the um, newly renovated SHU Sacred Heart University Community Theater in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, Bill's family was very involved in the civil rights movement and he has lots of great insights about that. So welcome, Bill. Uh, so tonight, I don't even know where to start. I think we have to start with the big news that just happened in the last couple of hours. So I'm going to turn things over to Adrian Reedy. Adrian, um, let's talk about the Derek Chauvin trial and what just happened. Well, I have to tell you, um, Megan, I could not watch. I couldn't watch any of the trial. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to relive that because that for me was a catalytic event in my life. Uh, the George Floyd, the, the, the senseless murder of George Floyd will, it's changed me for life. Mm -hmm. I have to also say, I, in the back of my mind, I didn't think that we would receive this news today. And so I, I get choked up even wanting, you know, t thinking about it right now, that uh, the fact that he, guilty, 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 I don't want to say that justice has been served yet, but um, I'm so relieved and hopeful for- Justice has been brought to the table, perhaps. Well, yes, there, the, the, the spotlight is shining ever so brightly. I think justice will happen when our country understands the fact that there was a trial to begin with and the fact that there was a senseless killing and there and the fact that there continues to be killings going on um in this manner something I, that's interesting adrian that you mentioned is you know that you didn't actually think they were going to come through and there's a reason for that because historically um there have been a lot of times when uh the justice 
has not been served. Exactly. And uh, so I don't know if some of you want to talk about anybody else wants to jump in on that or are we? No. Okay. Bill? Can't hear you. You're on mute, Bill. You're on mute, Bill. So sorry. I'm sure you wish you could do that with me at home. <laughs> yes, that would be great at home. <laughs> it be wonderful. Um, uh, again, like Adrian, I, you know, I'm heartened by this decision. You know, I will say on the outset, you know, I'm a big black man in a white man's world. Uh, I am George Floyd. I have, um, you know, and I'm just saying that in dramatic uh, fashion, and it's not a political statement. It's just a, a simple fact of life. It's something that I live with every day. Uh, not that I live with it from honestly looking in the mirror. I live with it because of how people uh, approach or treat me. And, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, in my heart, I don't believe it is an oversensitivity uh, on my part. And I'm not just, you know, it's not like looking for microaggressions. It's just what 60 plus years of living has taught me. Uh, and I say that also knowing that I have no I mean, I have no complaints. I've been extraordinarily blessed and successful uh, in my work, my career and, and, and life. Um, and I can't fault anyone in particular, although I, uh, I, I do fault in some ways uh, the nature of the systemic, the pernicious uh, sense of racism which is, and, and you know, I'm sorry, we're gonna get right into the, the hard part, but is the DNA of this country. Uh, does it mean that a, um, you know, I, I'm kind of, a, I live too long to think that it's ever really gonna change because I do believe it's in the DNA. Does not mean that we can't take moments like this to celebrate oh. some progress, to hopefully learn from it, to be enlightened? Uh, but, you know, I, I asked the same question. We didn't know this from Rodney King. We didn't right. know this from the hundreds of other things. Eric uh, Garner. My greatest fear yeah. in this is, um, you know, first, this never would have happened without this visceral public spectacle, which was no less, and, uh, and, and honestly, I think anybody who doesn't really view this, and thankfully I believe the, the jury did, as really a modern day lynching, a killing of a black man in broad daylight with impunity by someone who thought it didn't matter. It, it, right? I'm gonna interrupt you there. Yeah, Adrian, I, I wanted to talk about, um, I wish I meant to start with, uh, your concept of uh, gracism, uh, with racism and grace, because I think, um, we're hoping that will be a theme tonight. So can you explain to us a little bit what that is? Yeah, I mean, you know, I will often tell people that there are enough racists in, in, in the world, there are enough. But what I'm hoping and able, for me, what I'm hoping in, in order for us to move forward, I believe that we need to help to raise a generation of gracists. And so what that means is that the same, first of all, to me, I think it's important, I'm a woman of faith. So I think it's important for me to say that I believe that the image of God is literally imprinted on every single human being. So because of that, I also realized that I have been extended grace in just the fact that who, who I, who I believe God is and what he's done for me, the love that he's giving to me, I believe it is my duty to extend that love and grace to others. Okay. And so Go grace ahead. is simply extending the grace to be able to show, because of the image of God that's marked on each of us to show kindness, humanity that, that you, you know, this is this is why this this George Floyd case was such a uh, it 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 rocked me to my core uh, because of the nature of how it was done, how Chauvin killed, murdered this man 
who was, you know, so, so the, the idea that he didn't see the humanity mm -hmm. in George Floyd for whatever he did and whatever he, he accused or thought he did that was so bad, the fact that the humanity of this other, this individual was no, it, no, it didn't mean anything. And so for me, the fact that people can live like that and think that they will not be reprimanded for their behavior and that there are people who support that, you know. So I believe that in order to move forward, it's all hands on deck. I may be angry and I may be sad because I have, I always like to say I have three biracial, that could have been my, my son, Ahmaud Arbery, could have been my son whose birthday was, he shared a birthday like right around the same, same age, same, you know, likes to go out for runs. That could have been my son. And so for that to be the, the okay, the, the norm, I have a problem with that. And so in order for me to stay sane, <laughs> to stay sane, I need to be able to look at this and say, okay, in order for us to heal from this insidious disease of sin of racism, in order for us to heal, I need to be able to extend grace and have the conversation. It, I get really excited knowing that it was a lot of the young people that was out, they went out and forced to, 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 to seek a change and change is happening. That happened because the spotlight has been on this case all year. And so things, I'm hopeful, but yeah, I know that there's a lot more that needs to be done. I will celebrate this moment, but at the same time, I'm going to roll my sleeves up and I'm going to do everything in my power to help people come to the understanding that it's, it's, it's extending grace. We have to be able to treat one another with love and respect. Golden rule all, the, all along, do unto others. Well, on that note, uh, Kelly, you have some of those same beliefs and you were talking about learning and unlearning. So could you expand a little bit more on that idea? Sure, I'd love to. Um, first of all, let me just say, I'm so appreciative that we're here today and having this conversation. I think back to about a year ago when there was that march, um, the, the, the march, that started off at the um, train station and ended up at Our Lady of Fatima. And it was um, an interfaith gathering. And there were so many people from the community there. And um, so many hearts were laid open. And um, to me, what was so amazing was to see the young people who are so much further along in understanding um, the true dynamics of racism than people my age are. And so I'll, I'll freely admit, you know, um, a 55 year old white woman, um, I am a social worker, but I'd been working for a foundation that was really focused on funding programs where young people organized against powers of oppression that were holding them back. And it was in my role there at that foundation that I needed to open up my eyes and see a world from other people's perspectives that were very different from my own. And I had a coworker who was really loving, really patient, talk about gracism, um, Adrienne, she, she walked with me and she showed me that the person I am is a person who's been conditioned by all these external influences. And that although it's very painful to say I'm a racist, right? Um, it's one has to at some point hold up a mirror and say, I have racist tendencies, right? I have biases and I need to examine what they are and where they came from. And, uh, you know, I think last time we were talking, Megan, I made, um, I had alluded to the analogy of the Jenga game. Mm -hmm. Many people have it. It's pieces of wood that stack up in different directions. And for me, my unlearning was very much like playing a Jenga game. I mean, here I thought I was a complete person, you know, a tower. And I had to slowly start pulling pieces out and looking at them and saying, what, what am I really built of? And um, 
it's a process I have to, it's painful, it's hard. Um, it's something I am committed to doing every single day. It involves reading books, listening to podcasts, having conversations with people, listening, 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 listening to their stories. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a journey and I'm on the journey and I'm committed to being on the journey. And I just, I, I want to do more, learn more, be better and help others um, on their journey. You know, uh, there, there is- I still say, Megan, if I could, um, just to respond to Kelly, I mean, number one, we're all on a journey. Uh, there's absolutely no, no doubt. We all have our intrinsic biases. Um, so, and that's just human nature. I mean, it's, it's how we're raised, it's where we're raised, it's kind of who we are. Uh, I think what's really important in this conversation and, and certainly what you're doing in examining this is how did we get to that? Mm -hmm. And what part of that do we need to put into greater perspective in a way? Uh, you know, uh, in, in particular, Wilton is quite a rarefied little place in the universe. Uh, and I'm sure not many people, nor should they have to be, um, you know, have to be so conscious or aware or even interested in some things. It unfortunately takes like really horrific experiences for that to kind of seep into our little world and us to, to kind of talk about it. But I do think the, um, uh, you know, the exercise, if you will, the, the, the hard work to really examine things that are a little outside your comfort zone, which is a little what we're doing tonight, outside of your life experience even, uh, you know, Megan's from Canada, a lot of these racist issues, which, uh, you know, which are really endemic uh, with the American story in a way are not part of Canadian culture uh, kind of at all, uh, but you still have to appreciate, have some, you know, not just, you know, sensitivity or empathy about it, but some human consideration, which is a little bit uh, what Adrian's talking about as well, and what you are to say, you know, more than godly, what's the right thing? What's the human thing? Uh, and then um, that's how you become uh, a little more aware, you know, I'm not saying yeah. a better person, but more aware of who you are, what your surroundings are, and what uh, sensitivities you should be aware of. And if I may, um, I also, I've learned something recently, and it seems so obvious, and I feel so ridiculous that I didn't learn it earlier. Uh, so, you know, everyone's talking about white privilege and white privilege, and you're like, you know, you start feeling like, well, I can't help it. I was born, the, you know, you have this sort of innate feeling, you know, like you feel guilty and bad, but you're like, it's not my fault. But what I tried to do instead of feeling, you know, defensive is I looked at the prism, um, you know, I've been married to Bill, we've been together for, we've been together for 24 years. Well, and so I have experienced. It, magical years. Magical years. Um, <laughs> so I have experienced things, you know, I, I, that I didn't experience growing up in Canada, but I've also experienced things through his eyes. And um, it's almost like, you know, when you realize you have that realization that your parents are really just people who are doing their best. And it didn't happen for me until I was in my 20s about my parents. So this realization was and this is so embarrassing, but I'm going to put it out there because other people may identify with this, was that I thought, you know, my life experience as a white blonde person who grew up in actual privilege was that, you know, the police were always nice to me. Uh, I never got checked in customs. People were always come right this way. People were always treating me, you know, the way people should be treated. And I realized just recently that that doesn't happen, that I have this kind of ticket um, that other people don't have. And, you know, sure, I'm a woman and men have certain privileges that women don't have, but, but it's different. Race makes it different. And it is, um, it was very humbling to have that realization. And I just, I know it sounds silly, but I just wanted to share it. And now I'm gonna, I wanna reach over to Chris, um, because Chris, I want to talk about your family's experience, uh, which was unique. It was in the 60s, 50s actually. Um, and your parents took, a, 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 your father in particular, took a real stand against um, systemic racism and segregation. And uh, so let's go back a little bit in history and, and talk about 
those experiences and how they have impacted um, your view of the world today? Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm really honored to be amongst you all and I respect so much what you are doing with your lives and how you're trying to affect change. And in a way, I feel like, oh, I'm not doing that much. I'm sort of do, doing what I can within the like musical bubble of things. But um, as, a, as a kid growing up uh, in the hills above Oakland, um, there was a lot of deep respect for Martin Luther King and Jesus Christ. I know my parents felt that they're on the, the same level in terms of philosophical heavyweight uh, things that they would say. And so the whole idea that you judge someone by not the color of their skin, but the content of their character was living in real life in our house in terms of when I would hear these great musicians come over and start playing jazz. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking about Eugene Wright, who was an African-American originally from Chicago. And he, he was like my godfather. So uh, it was just totally... I sort of didn't feel anything. I mean, in our house, it was like, can he play? That, that's what, <laughs> <laughs> that was the big judgment thing. And, um, and, uh, and speaking of Eugene Wright, um, he died recently, uh, just around the beginning of this year. And, um, and, and he, in a way, he had this great attitude that you have to have almost like Jackie Robinson did for, for baseball, is that, um, he joined my father's group in 1958 before they did this huge State Department tour when, when the big deal for America to get their image of who we are in America out behind the Iron Curtain was a thing called the Voice of America it was broadcasting like the internet. They couldn't stop it with the Berlin Wall or anything, but sound waves would go over there. And um, so the regular bass player they had, he couldn't hack the long tour. It was gonna be heavy and they, asked Gene if he wanted to go and he and he went and, and he was fantastic and he's always had this up attitude about any situation he was in and uh, to make a long story a little shorter when my father got back from that tour where the musicians were being called the jazz ambassadors and representing America and doing such a great job of making cultural connections and we're talking about literally with the diplomats American diplomats you know having parties meet the poets the intellectuals the authors you know the Natasha's of whatever world you're in uh, and they come back to the United States and they couldn't stay in the same hotel, you know, and that was just so horrible that my parents ended up writing a musical called The Real Ambassadors, yeah. which was too controversial to ever go on Broadway, but it starred Louis Armstrong and Carmen McRae. And, um, and shortly after that tour in 58, there was a giant tour of the South that my dad had with all the colleges in the Southern, you know, University of uh, Arkansas or whatever, you know, all the big schools. And they showed up with Eugene Wright and there were these situations where they said, you didn't say you're gonna have a black man playing in the group, we can't allow this. you know. And there would be threats of canceling the concerts and some of the concerts were canceled. Um, but on the other hand, the students would be like stomping their feet in the bleachers because like, the, the group was hot and they wanted to see it. <laughs> so sometimes that would mean that the president of the school would be calling Oral Fabus or George Wallace or something said like, you know, we want to ride or we're going to let these guys play, you know? So um, anyhow, there was a lot of uh, changes that happened that way. And then finally, um, my father said, hey, you know, we're just going to cancel the whole tour. I'm not going to be messing with this. And, and, and that was sort of a stand within the jazz industry that became unknown. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on. I don't want to uh, dominate this, but... Uh, it, well, it I like your your idea about action through the arts and how, uh, as I said earlier, you had mentioned before that um, culture and art and, and music and theater and film, they all bring us together. And uh, I think that has been uh, for a long time in the music industry, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I want to say two quick things. You were talking about you being Canadian. I know the first time I did a tour in Canada, I immediately felt this great lift, like, oh my God, this is such a more interracial society where I just feel whether you're an Indian or African-American or whatever, it felt so much more chilled out. And then also to point out that there was a lot of great jazz players that said, I can't take this anymore in the 60s. And they moved to Holland and they moved to Paris. And you know, it's a real part of 
you know, of jazz history, just to get away from this systemic uh, racism and, and uh, you know, and, and it, the art had to breathe more freely. It had to move and become more international. And, and, and going right back to America, one of the coolest things that ever happened to me, I was playing with another group with a, a former Wiltonian, Bill Crawford, who played banjo. And we had this kind of strange little group and we went down and we played in Selma, Alabama. And it was one of the nicest educational outreach things that we did. Uh, we usually do those in the daytime before a concert at night. It was in a charter art school within a half a block of the famous bridge in Selma, Alabama. And the kids had the best spirit and the entire, every wall was painted. The kids were so happy and clapping and dancing and involved and they had their own little bands and everything. And it really just hit me like, wow, does that signify that through the arts and giving people an educational opportunity, I couldn't believe how this, this little magnet school was just flourishing so well. So it, it really gave me a lot of hope about as, as, as oppressive and, and, and depressing as it's been at different times in America, that you know, there's all these different signs that we're growing and getting better as well. And we have to balance these two things constantly, you know, so let's and hard work. Let's talk about that. You know, I mean, there was during the Obama years, there was a feeling that things were getting better. And then in the last several years, it feels like we've taken, you know, uh, two big steps backwards. I looked today on Wikipedia, there are 26 white supremacy organizations that they know of listed in the US. They had um, white supremacist organizations in countries all around the world. If you go on Wiki, they are, they're all listed there. Um, and white separatists and wanting to you know, segregate. And then there seems to be so much hatred, uh, you know, not just to African-American and black people, but to people spitting on uh, Chinese people or Asians or um, you know, punching them in the street. Like there's, there seems to be this hatred and anger and is that because things are changing is that because the sort of the white guard is is going down why why is there so much why does it seem like there's a knee-jerk reaction to all this hatred right now does anybody want to comment on that i mean i, I i'd like to to add um uh, something to that you know i can't help but wonder if there's a huge amount of fear in people right now. Uh, when you look at, I, I, I forget the statistics, but within the next, I believe what year, uh, there's, there's a year 20... 2050. 50, where, mm -hmm. you know, the, there will be more people of color for the first time, African-Americans, people of color, where white people will be the minority. And I can't help but think that there is this idea that in the land of the free and the land of plenty, that for some reason, there's a, a, a group of people who are very, very afraid that there's not going to be enough for me, not only not enough for me, meaning you know the the that the noun what will be the minority. That for some reason there's going to be this idea that people of color or minorities would not be able to to be fair. I I think that it we need to take a look at, at this because there's this fear that somehow white people are going to be mistreated by black people or by people of color. I think that's something that should be looked at. Bill? Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, Adina, to pick up, um... You know, clearly the, you know, the vitriol around this, I believe, are the death throes of what has been historically 
um, again, white male control, white old men, sorry, and I'm old enough, um, uh, you know, of this country. And, uh, and they feel like, although we're very far away from losing all the power, all the money, you know, all the political influence. So, I mean, nothing's slipping away that quickly. What we hope is slipping from their grasp is uh, the sense of humanity and civil rights in this country that we can finally be treated in a way. Um, uh, and listen, at this point, I'm not even, you know, it's not even equality. I just, you know, want to be treated as a normal human being in a way, um, uh, you know, without, you know, many of the uh, restrictions or the assumptions that kind of go along with having a darker skin. Uh, there's, you know, I think, and I, I want to talk a little bit to, to, to Kelly's point and to Chris's in a way, which is, you know, the great thing is that, you know, um, uh, talent, presumably, uh, and skill as we're kind of, you know, taught uh, is, is colorblind, if you will. You know, to Chris's point, you either can play this or you can't play this. I don't care who you are, where you come from, what language you speak, because you're kind of, you know, being judged on your, your, your experience and talent there. And to Kelly's, I think it kind of gets to the point of you either have um, a heart that's open to the human condition that allows you to accept, to accept um, you know, all people. None of this, you know, I wish I could say, none of this is going away. And I think this is, this is even the bigger issue, maybe to Adrian's point. The, the education, if you will, or the appreciation is, guess what? Black people have been here as long as everybody else who's kind of, you know, other than Native Americans that showed up here. Black people without, again, putting my beret and my leather glove on uh, and raising my fist uh, have been the foundation of what made this country great in the beginning from an economic basis, from, uh, again, supporting uh, the growth of this country. And I would even argue, uh, having known uh, Martin Luther King, my family's very steeped in civil rights. Uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, Chris talked about Jackie Robinson. He's my cousin's godfather and we spent weekends up at his place. Uh, and, and that really speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, the, the struggle isn't over <laughs> uh, and it kind of continues. But not only were we, uh, you know, as a culture, and this is why, you know, again, there is, and I think, you know, I think people are really afraid of, of uh, it's not so much anger or resentment anymore, because honestly, generations have passed, not that we've forgotten anything. Um, but we're not out for retribution, you know, as a, as, a, as a culture. You know, we're again just looking for us to live up to what the standards were, you know, honestly, the founding fathers. Right. Well, men have created equal. Let's just start and end with that in a right. way. Right. And try to embrace that and, and, and be treated equally. And again, Adrian, to your point, um, you, you know, I think it's really an issue, uh, even though it's, it's rooted in fear of the other, fear of what's going to happen if we do lose all this power, fear of what's changing. You know, I actually say this about, you know, this is a weird analogy about COVID. Everybody's like, well, when are we going to be back to normal? It's like, guess what? This is normal now. This is the new normal. As much as we can embrace this and live with it and accept it, then we're actually going to be much healthier. Right you know, as a community. And I think that's very much, again, it's a tortured analogy here, but very much with racism. As, as, as long as we can, you know, start to appreciate and not out of fear, accept what our history is, our history is our history. You know, get over it. I'm not battling that. I'm just battling the fact that you can't deny that, you know, we have systemic racism. You can't deny the fact that we have, uh, over many years, separated families, incarcerated Black men. I know there are real issues, but there's something really wrong, you know, with you have 70% of young black men somehow right. going into the penal system one way or the other. Right. You know, that's just not right. Mm -hmm. That we have systemically not, I'll shut up in one second, you know, given the same kind of opportunities for education, uh, economic development and things like that. That's what keeps people down of right. any color, of any stripe, religion uh, or background. And what we need to do is not keep, you know, overcompensating, just get off our backs yeah, let yeah. people walk freely and be fine and i think that uh, you know comes to you know i hear so much i mean chris lives that in his art kelly's living it through her heart and you know in her effort to just and, and again kelly kind of comes back to it's not about 
you know, people don't have to, uh, you know, go through a lot of, uh, you know, tortured analysis about, you know, why we are the way we are. You just have to say, okay, yeah, it's been pretty messed up. And yeah, yeah I'm trying my best. Uh, and I'm trying to live a way that, um, you know, as we all want to live, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not, you know, overly prejudging, even though we all have our biases and all have our prejudices. Mm -hmm. that's, that's completely normal. But when you appreciate that and recognize that, you have a chance to move past that. Well, and, and to that point, you know, I'm astonished when people say, I don't understand what systematic racism is. Um, and then, you know, I work in Bridgeport and, and, and I have the great pleasure of interacting with families, individuals, parishes, and, you know, our education system is not equal. And, mm -hmm. and to Adrian's point, why are people afraid of bringing equality to something as basic as education? Right. You can't compare what's happening in this town or the next suburb over to what's happened in our urban cities. And, That's right. And, and so to me, it's like, well, there is the systematic racism, or even in a place of work, who has the positions of leadership? Um, yes, there may be some diversity, but is that diversity there at the leadership level? And if not, if we are all children of God, and if we are all born equal, and if we all say that, then we really need to say, well, why am I in a room of all white people and and where is there something happening here that I didn't see before that I need to see, that I need to right. learn, I need to understand, to invite people into that room or frankly, to walk out of that room forever and saying, this is not where I want to be. This right. is not it. And, you know, if you don't have friends um, who are people of color, come from diverse cultures, you're missing out. You're, it's so your loss. And you need to step outside of, of whatever the boundaries are that prevents you from broadening um, the beauty of your life, the beauty right. of the work you do. It can only be better with other people's perspectives. And, you know, it's, it's sad to see that, that so many people are missing out and misunderstand. Um, so. Uh, I, I, Megan, oh, if I could just say, I, I, I feel that it's, you know, Wilton is unique, and I feel that I, I'm. I must say that you know, my 24 years of living in Wilton, I'm not saying that all of it was um, was was peachy keen, but but for the most part, I mean, this is a jewel. Uh, uh, this community is a, a jewel in Fairfield County. In that, uh, I'm a strong advocate for a program you know, we have an ABC, uh, a better chance here in Wilton. Now, to me, the fact that um, a better chance has to even exist, I just believe that every child in the United States of America should have access to a great education. I just think that we as a, a country, we owe that to our children. But in the town of Wilton, we've had ABC going on for 25 years. Uh, my experience with, I, I can't get off this, this, this call without saying my experience living in Wilton for 24 years with the Wilton police has always been a great experience. Now, now I can't speak on other African-American families, but I can speak for my experience and for my family, it's always been a good experience. So I think overall, Wilton, we've had great experiences. My children had great experience in the school system, but then there were some issues that did come up that were not so good. But for the most part in Wilton, it's, it's been a great experience. And so I feel that you know, at the same time, when I look at what's going on around the country, I, I often say, I just wish everyone had an opportunity to have the experience that I've had being here in, in a town like Wilton. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Adrian. We looked at a number of towns, which shall remain nameless. Right. <laughs> um, 
And my litmus test was always, does the hair on the back of my neck stand up? And I would go to the parks with our young son and there were not a lot of mothers. It was a lot of nannies at the park. And I talked to the nannies and asked them what their experience was. And if they were, you know, minorities or a person of color, I would say, what is your experience in this town? Right. And they told me, and I was like, I don't want to live here. You know, right. I don't want to raise my child here. That's right. So um, we actually have a couple of comments. So I'm going to just kind of do them along the way so they don't get backed up. First from Elliot Z. He says, the historical roots of all discrimination has been rooted in the concept that anything good for the quote other is at the expense of the us. Love to have Bill and Megan develop a way to televise stream Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us. I'm, I'm not familiar with that book. I will look it up uh, to make its examples and insight clear to broader audience that then will likely read it. Um, Thank you, Elliot. I, I have, does, do any of you know this book? Um, have any of you read this? No. No? No. No. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Elliot. We appreciate that. Um, and conversation is always a good thing. So uh, we have another one from Irene. Uh, and she says, the GI Bill failed to include our black soldiers that fought in World War II. Uh, that was a setback for black families that were denied a right to join the American dream. What a great point. She also says, when we include their children, grandchildren and great grandchildren, we can see the tragedy of how exclusion affected not only them, but a white society that unfairly judged them and resented their uh, in quote, inability to succeed. Um, that's a wonderful point. Uh, and in fact, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say it's interesting because with the book Memorial Drive, um, the stepfather who you know ultimately killed Natasha's mother, um, you know, came back from war, da injured, damaged, and and did not benefit from um, the supports that should have been um, there for him, um, which which was a very you know it was a sub theme within within Memorial Drive, I found, um, and, you know, a sad reality about how, how many of the Black um, soldiers and, and folks who were involved in fighting for our country um, were, you know, were appreciated and until they got back, until they came home. Well, and, and a lot of soldiers were cannon fodder, you know, they were, they were, yeah. they preyed upon people who, um, were not as well educated, who were uh, more of a from a working class background, and there were a lot of people of privilege who got bone spurs. So um, I won't say who, <laughs> but, uh, but I think to um, uh, I, I forget her name, Irene's point, the woman who just yes, Irene, uh, you, you know, and a lot of people didn't realize how that impacted African American families, um, you know, generations. And so in the book, uh, Waking Up White, I know that um, Deborah Irving mentions that, uh, she has a whole chapter about the GI Bill. And, you know, a lot of people didn't even realize that. And so these are the things that uh, I, I think, I love the fact that people are becoming more educated and people are writing and talking about this. And I think that it's so important that we have continue to have these types of discussions, not just, I think they need to happen all the time um, so that we could become more educated and, and, and do better, <laughs> live better, be better people to understand people's situations and not just look at those people over there and, and, and judge them for um, things that have happened. Elliot has written back and he was talking about Lynn Vanderslice sending out an email bulletin today uh, about the proposal for moderate priced housing so that we could have more people, um, we could have uh, more mixed incomes and people in our school system and diversity makes us stronger is, is what many people think, but some people don't think diversity makes us stronger. Do any of you want to comment on uh, 
on this initiative, which is not just in our town, but in many towns in Connecticut? Uh, if I could just say, and I don't want to speak exactly to the initiative or the issues or the zoning, you know, or, or the housing issue in particular, uh, but I will speak a little bit to obviously our experience in Wilton, which we moved here for a reason uh, and we looked around. Uh, I will say, and this isn't really, um, uh, you know, an argument uh, or a comment, uh, you know, against Wilton. In fact, I think maybe it's a little bit of, you know, perhaps, a, a, you know, a point of insight in a way, at least my insight, is one of the things, um, you know, obviously we're here in Wilton, relatively speaking, you know, we're very well off. Uh, we're somewhat well educated. Uh, we're, you know, we're connected in a way, um, and uh, which is all the things you have to do to fit in uh, and belies your skin color in a way. It makes you kind of a little more acceptable uh, and not so much an other. Small, and this gets to my little nitpicky, um, you know, microaggression in a way. Uh, at the same time that we are uh, supporting and embracing the community, which is fabulous, uh, I, I cannot tell you the number of times I'm in Megan's, I'm in Stop and Shop, shopping for groceries, and people come up and ask me to get things for them. And I'm tall, and I'm always happy to do that, but the assumption is I don't belong there, uh, I work there. And, you know, again, it's a stupid little thing. It, you know, it's not a thing at all, except I think it kind of comes back to what is your base assumption? And one of the things we have to do, uh, even here in our little town, is say, oh, gee, I guess there are different kinds of people who live here <laughs> anyway. And they're not just people who are, you know, coming in on the train or on the, the bus to come and work here in our privileged town. They're actually people who are kind of accomplished and who live here. Now, whether that, and again, I can get it, whether that should be extended, uh, you know, our beautiful community to people who don't quite have the same level of economic benefit that we uh, generally enjoy, uh, I think is a, uh, is a question for us. Uh, and it's a little question of comfort, but again, it's, it's, it's really, you know, people aren't coming out to Wilton to try and riot. They're coming out to have a decent lifestyle. So it's really just about lowering the barrier of, uh, or the fear of the other, embracing, you know, part of what Kelly's talking about, uh, you know, embracing all of us as, um, you know, thankfully decent human beings and productive members of society and giving all of us a chance to actually contribute in that way. And on that note, um, we've just learned what the sum of us is about, which ties in really nicely with this. The sum of us focuses on how the zero sum game outlook obscures harm to not just the people of color, but to all people in the nation, except perhaps the 0.01%. Uh, so that's a really interesting, and, and again, it's almost what Chris was talking about, the arts of people coming together from all different backgrounds and and with all different cultures, you know, you can create magical music and, and break new barriers because you're all working together instead of playing the same thing over and over and over again. And I mean, you're a composer, Chris, it, it, it you know, you must get inspiration from everywhere, right? Yeah, I, I really do. And also I have a, a quirky side to my classical composing is I like writing big narrated pieces where I dig into like the story of uh, Iwo Jima or Teddy Roosevelt, uh, something about him, Roosevelt and Cowboy Land. I mean, that's a whole thing where I, I, I like to take people into a concert hall, but I really love history. If I weren't a composer, I'd be into history. And uh, I try to reach people in that way. And I know my parents wrote, uh, besides a lot of jazz tunes, my parents wrote a lot of religious pieces. And the reason they did that is because they really wanted to use biblical texts to remind people that proclaimed that they're Christians to act like Christians. <laughs> and maybe, you know, through, through music and the power of the way it's sung, maybe they hold up a mirror and say like, hey, have I strayed from Jesus's words? And 
while I have the floor for a second, I want I want to just throw out an idea. Like when we're talking about the Natasha's novel, and uh, Kelly, you brought up about the man that murdered Nat Natasha's mother, how he wasn't right in the head. Really, it was from Vietnam, if I recall. Right. And mm -hmm. you know, and then we're talking about and, and, and Megan and Bill. I would imagine one of the reasons you wanted to, to live in Wilton is because we have a, a good education system, or you know, maybe a great one. But what I wonder, wonder about is like, we always find money for war. Man, it just grows on trees, you know? It's, it's just incredible. And I, I'm very conscious of the arts, you know, but you know, we'll get a statistic from some sort of national music organization. Did you know that one bomber uh, costs more than all the money given to the United States in arts? But forget about that. Let's just think about education. And it makes me wonder like, is there, I don't know who the them is, now I'm doing the us and them thing, but it, are there people that really think the United States is gonna be a better oiled machine by making sure that we don't have educated people? Because then the people that have no way out, then they have to join the army. And if we keep people dumb enough, then maybe they'll fall, follow just the most outrageous claims you know, like forest fires started by Jewish spaceships, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, if people were really smart and we were talking about hate, we were talking about fear, has anyone ever uh, figured out like if the more educated a person is, are, are they less fearful? Um, are we let's, just more easy manipulated? And let's I, talk a little bit about that because I want to go back in history since we're talking about Wilton, a couple of things um, for those of you who haven't seen the Historical Society um, videos, you really should. There was some surprising news in uh, the videos and the volunteer fire department um, from I think 19, was it 1935 to 1965? used to do a basically blackface minstrel show as their fundraiser every year. And that's like 1965. Wow. Um, and they someone finally realized that it wasn't a great idea. And another local Wilton story, I mean, Doug and Betty Jones were the first people of color to move here. Um, the extraordinary Doug and Betty Jones were so lucky to have them and their family here. Uh, and the only reason they were able to get a house because it was understood that you do not sell your home to people of color. You just were minorities, you just don't. But it was a, a Jewish gentleman who owned a house and he was mad at the town because he felt that he was the victim of prejudice. And so he did it to kind of thumb his nose at the Wilton community. Um, so it, it came as a spiteful gesture, but thank God, because we got an incredible family, uh, a, a talented family, a beautiful family um, who, you know, sort of paved the way. But that's fear. Like if you don't want people, and it's not necessarily just African-American people, it's, it's brown people, it's Asian people, it's Muslims, it's people who are different. And this, this xenophobia, which is universal, by the way, it, you know, we don't, Americans don't have a, you know, a stranglehold on this, but w where are we, we, we know where we've been, where are we going? What are the positives? How can we move forward? What can we do? If, if I could, just two things. I want to uh, chase Chris down the conspiratorial rabbit hole for a second uh, <laughs> and talk about, you know, right down to the, you know, industrial military complex, which is set up to build bombs and sell, you know, and promote war. And, uh, you know, to my mind, uh, uh, you know, not only in the incarceration, but conscript uh, people who are desperate to help keep the war machine going. And, you know, to my mind, it's also no different than the penal system here. It's an industry, which is not just pernicious, it controls a lot of things. And, you know, the way to do that is to affect you know, laws and um, you know, issues that, you know, that bring more people into prisons, many of them, you know, kind of, of color, of course. Um, but Chris, also, as we kind of step out of this and talk about where we go from here, I think the, um, you know, part of the answer is, you know, not so much that colorblind, and it's not about being colorblind, it's actually about being inclusive to the rainbow. Uh, you know, to, to, to torture a, a metaphor here, you know, you need an orchestra 
uh, to make really beautiful music. And yeah, you can have some great soloists and that's all fine and they all play the same notes or the same style or something. But once you actually kind of mix things up and you uh, put aside kind of your, uh, and it's not even prejudices, just kind of your, your comfort level and you open your mind to everything from, oh, this is pretty tasty food. <laughs> or I love going to, you know, I used to travel around and go to every church synagogue and mosque I could when I was traveling because I just thought it was so great to kind of get into a spiritual sense, uh, you know, the people and not to really judge, uh, you know, what their beliefs because everybody should believe what they what they want to believe. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's really the strength of uh, what we hope is, you know, this long arc <laughs> towards justice in a way, uh, or to the better side uh, of, of our angels is to really uh, embrace that it's not, you know, you don't see celebrate or make it good. Just don't make things bad. Give things a chance to actually, and, and I think you'll find just as most of us, and you know, those of us who are blessed enough to, to travel, to have, uh, you know, uh, many friends for, with different perspectives, whether it's, you know, political, religious, uh, racial, or anything else, uh, you really find if you are honest with yourself and you have this open heart that, you know, both Kelly and Adrian seem to have, I'm a little bit more of a cynical uh, person, uh, but you realize it's really enriching to your life that you don't, you know, there, there was this one thing, um, and Marcus said, that, you know, you can't, uh, you know, love and hate are diametrically opposed in a way, and you have to let go of something to embrace, you know, the other thing. So it really is. You know, the more we let go of hate, the more our hands are free to actually embrace or at least hold right. uh, some humanity yeah. or love in it. Kelly, you yeah. had talked about how um, there is no syllabus for this. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, goodness. I mean, I think I think everyone, you know, who is on this journey sort of starts and then they stop and then they pivot and they do different things. I mean, for me, it's been a variety of um, different ways that I've opened up my world. Um, one of the things I did want to mention that I think is a wonderful resource, and I'm so grateful to the library for engaging the community in this, this book, The Black Friends. I picked it up. It was um, provided free of charge to, to all of the Wilton residents. And I'll tell you, if you're at all interested in step one on a very large syllabus, it's read this book. It is such a wonderful, wonderful book um, for folks to just sit down and say, okay, I want it, I want it given to me straight. Um, this our author, Frederick Joseph, does a great job of just putting it out there to white people who sort of want to begin this journey, right? And so, um, you know, as it relates to syllabus, I think, you know, you can build your own. And um, if you get stuck, there are some wonderful resources at the library. There's a couple of DVDs there. There's one DVD in particular called The Color of Fear. Adrian and I um, have discussed it and watched it. Um, that I highly recommend. Um, and there's another one called, If These Halls Could Talk. It's perfect for the high school, college age individual wanting to begin their journey or start building their syllabus. And, and, and Kelly, if I can, I just want to jump in real, real quick. Um, I, I mean, it's such a shame <laughs> that we need books like this, of course. Um, uh, you know, a primer to understanding racism. But there's no shame in under, you know, having an appreciation that this was not in your, uh, you know, in, in your life experience and to help, uh, it's not just, again, it's like to, to learn more about yourself, you know, don't worry about learning yeah. about me, learn more about yourself and how you want to live your life. And I think that's one of the things is there's kind of fear and there's guilt is the other side. Well, and, uh, and certainly for people who are older and say, well, I don't need to either learn anything or this is, you know, this is too pat or simple. Um, uh, you know, again, uh, primer or no, uh, it, it's always worth exploring some of these things, even from the most basic yeah. you know, elementary level 
and continue to grow your perspective and your appreciation of all this. The springboard for sure. Uh, and in the book, The Black Friend, can you explain for those people who haven't um, actually read it, he, 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 the author reached out, he used examples from his own life, correct? Um, yes. And reached out to many other of his friends to ask them about their personal experiences. Can you share a few of them? Well, you know, the chapter, the first chapter starts off with why, you know, oftentimes a white person will say, I don't see color and, and just sort of explain why that is just not accepted by um, folks who are people of color. They want you to see their color. They want you to embrace it and to um, see all the beauty that comes with it. Um, he talks about situations of being in school where, you know, he was a young black man and he had a lot of white friends. Um, and, you know, one example was about microaggressions. He goes to the friend's house and the father wants to know how he, you know, let, let's see you palm a ball. You know, the, the assumption that he had to be an athlete because he was tall and he was black when he wasn't an athlete. Um, but he understood that this was sort of like the stereotype and, you know, other sort of um, slights that would happen, you know, friends saying, oh, you're, you're so cool, you know, you're dark skin on the outside, but you're like a white person on the inside and would jokingly call him an Oreo, you know, and it's like, you know, you're, you're listening to this and you're kind of remembering back to when you were in high school and how, like, yeah, maybe some jerk said that and maybe you laughed and now you're kind of like, oh, I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to see not only from Frederick's um, perspective, but the other people that he brings in and how, you know, in many ways, situations happened that were really hurtful, very painful. Um, and nobody stood by him. Nobody defended him, even though they were friends, you know, and how alone he felt during some of these critical moments. Um, but then also talks, I literally laughed out loud, which is, you know, he talks about some very light moments when, you know, people did come through and when he did meet folks from, um, you know, families that were much more enlight in, enlightened and, um, you know, accepting and, um, you know, loving. And, you know, some of those stories were, were filled with hope. And, and, you know, that's why it's a nice balance of a book for somebody to start with. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bill, I remember you telling me something early on uh, when we were, you know, new, fairly newly married. Uh, you said no one ever, you know, we, and we were in the Greenwich area, so we would go to social things. And he said, no one ever mistakes me for a doctor or a lawyer or a professional person. Everyone always assumed that he was in the entertainment business or uh, 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 you got weatherman, weatherman a lot. Or weatherman. <laughs> weatherman or okay, former weatherman, football player all football the time. Weatherman, or Gal Roker, you know. Uh, because um, again, those were, uh, if you will, you know, that was kind of the card that allowed you entry, you know, into this yeah. level. Very few would ever say, hi, Dr. Harris, or, you know, Mike, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, Professor Harris, <laughs> Or, uh, or give me some accolades for you know, running a, you know, a, an international company or doing some other things. And uh, you know, it's funny, it's not funny. Uh, and you know, it's not a microaggression so much, but it is, you know, it's the sense of, you know, I've said this and you know, we've done a, a, a few things. Um, and you know, give me a minute, because this is really very painful. I get it. If I saw myself walking down a dark street, I might cross the other side. And the thing about that is so painful is what does that say about my own self-interest, uh, my own self-worth uh, in a society that even I have been trained to fear myself uh, because I'm a black man. Um, it, it is, and, and that's why it's not a race. I mean, it's not about race. It's deeply ingrained in your training, in your culture, in your society that gives you these assumptions. Uh, and I'm ashamed to admit that, to say it in a way. 
because it is so personally painful uh, to me to recognize that's part of my bias, what has been, you know, in terms of being inculcated by, you know, almost, and I'm in the entertainment business, you know, almost every form of entertainment, you know, other than your basketball player or a rapper or something else, uh, you know, you look and it's law and order and you're the criminal. It's, you know, let's not talk about the incarceration rate or the news coverage or how, uh, how we seem to have a proclivity to kill a lot of young black men who maybe are not doing the smartest things in the world, but you don't need to shoot them. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there are ways to approach and, and you know, this again is, an, is not a blanket argument, but you can look at the number of cases, I believe, I would certainly believe it is disproportionate, the number of times and how, uh, and this isn't a policing thing, although it is, uh, on how uh, particularly young black males are treated. And I get the stereotypes, like I said, I admit that, I, I understand it, but uh, there are certain reasons there are certain interpretations, there are certain prejudices and perceptions that force all that to somehow become true or force you to live out uh, that fear perspective. We have, just to, we have to do better oh. with, uh, you, you know, the, the imaging that, that, that we have in our country. I mean, we have, to, we have to do a better job. I just have to say this one thing because Chris, you, had, you were talking about um, education and all. Were you aware that um, by the by the third grade in and many of the um, uh, urban areas by the third what, what they what 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 statistics are showing is that they will check the reading level of third graders uh, rather than put money into helping to educate they will look at building more prisons because they can tell oh. by oh the um, the reading level, you know, by the time a kid is in the third grade, they will then determine how many more prisons they need to build. Mm -hmm. Something has to change. If we can have money to build prisons, as communities, we should be able to make sure that our children are educated. We owe that to, to every single child in this country, around the world, but in this country of the, again, the United States of America, education is, is, is crucial. So if someone wants to be able to have uh, uh, lower income housing, does it, I always, wonder what people are thinking, you know, I didn't grow up in Fairfield County. Matter of fact, I'm the youngest of, of 10. And my mom and dad worked like the Dickens. We didn't grow up, we were not wealthy people. But, you know, we were a family that had values and I had the opportunity to get a good education. On that note, I'm going to transition over um, Steve Hudspeth, who I think most of us know has um, made a comment. Um, he said, there's a real education going on for all of us on the specific specifics of what racial injustice has meant from government imposed segregation in housing and education nationwide, not just in the South, to belittlement in so many ways from mean spirited slights to horrific lynchings the impact over generations, even in just the time span of many of us now living, has had a huge impact on black family security and resources and on individual opportunities. However, one of the saving graces of America is that eye-opening education at crucially receptive moments can move things forward dramatically. It doesn't happen easily to get national attention focused on anything, but what has happened in the last year especially has started a national education and we can hope it at least really moves us forward. Yes. So I and, and, and don't have that much more. Oh, okay, go ahead, Bill. Um, uh, you know, and that's kind of the bright spot, the good news here 
is that this does not have to be a, completely a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can uh, make some changes. They may feel uh, woefully inadequate and frustratingly uh, incremental in a way, but uh, again, I, I believe in my heart, I've lived some of this, you see some glimmers, although it doesn't mean we've cracked the code here uh, or figured out the algorithm. But I think there are ways, particularly in, in, in small ways in communities like this that can make a real change and really um, uh, help us all, but certainly uh, help lift some of the restrictions and barriers that we face as black Americans. I agree. And I think that is, uh, I'm sorry, Megan, uh, if I could just Go say, ahead. I agree. And I think that it is so important that we cannot stop. This mm -hmm. is all hand, this is, it's the hour. This is the time. This is what they would call a Kairos moment that we as a community, we as people in, in, in Fairfield County, uh, the state of Connecticut and the United States of America, this is the time. We ca I, I am urging that you don't stop having the conversation with just today that you continue to have the conversation. It must happen in order for the world to change. And this has everything to do with the world that we want to be able to give to our children's children and their children. You know, we have to continue to, to, to have roll up our sleeves. It's all hands on deck. Uh, I want to continue with that thought. I just want to acknowledge some, a few people who wrote some other comments so, so they feel heard. Um, uh, Kathy says, many prisons are privately owned and operated, which is, is true. And there is a financial incentive there. Um, and then Wilson says, we all contain multitudes. We're so much more than stereotypes. How yes. do we show that? Now, we only have a few minutes left. Thank you, both Wilson and Kathy. Um, I wanted to talk about positive things. How, you know, we don't live in a post-racial world and I, it makes me crazy when people say, oh, it's a post-racial, you know, I'm like, what world do you live in? Um, so what are the things, what are the positive steps that we uh, can take to make the world a better place, a more inclusive place, uh, equity, inclusion, diversity, what are some of the things we can do? I'm going to start with you, Kelly, this time. Oh, thank you. So, I, you know, I'm just a really big pest. I keep poking at people and pushing and saying, why would you want me on your board of directors when you don't have any diversity? You need to be focusing on growing your board in other ways or by giving um, folks I work with books about issues related to race. Um, conversations with my children who are all in their 20s, um, you know, about their thoughts. They are teaching me, it's amazing. But it's kind of like circles within circles within circles. You start with you, then you expand to your family, then your friends, then your community, then your workplace. And you keep asking, you keep digging, you keep pushing and you put yourself out there and say, how can I help? And, and you respond, um, that's my answer. <laughs> okay, Chris, what, what, what can we do for a more equity, inclusion, diversity, love, acceptance? What, what, would you, what are your final words? Uh, well, I think Kelly said a lot of the same things uh, I would, is I, I see with great admiration through my children, how their attitudes, I can just uh, tell that they grew up with a, I don't know what the word is, but they, they've been sort of cracking out of whatever we, in, we inherited as a culture. And, and because they're very aware of their grandfather and our family's history, you know, they sort of have a leg up and all that. Um, in, in terms of something positive, I wanted to tell you, Adrian, I had written a song already, already about that prison thing you were talking about. It's called Build It High and Mighty. And it's <laughs> Charlie Neville sang it, you know, yeah. so it's like, a very soulful thing about that very topic. I hope someday in my little positive thing, I can write some something yeah. that will move someone, you know, through music to recognize the brotherhood uh, in us all. And Bill, I just wanted to say that uh, with your point too, is that traveling is amazing because um, 
when you get outside, you're not only seeing is that a black person, is that a brown person, whatever, you're you're engaging person on their cultural turf. And it's liberating for you. Yeah. Like I couldn't believe there's a certain thing, like I'll see certain actors that are getting famous now, but like from the time the tours I did in South Africa, there's a thing about like African, South African. Black South Africans have every reason to be the most miserable people you ever met. But they have this vibe that is so like, whoa, it just put, I don't know where that comes from. But when you see it and feel it, you, you sort of capture that in your heart and your memories and you bring that back and you hope that somehow you can share that kind of energy. And I, and I wish it's too bad because COVID's cut it down. But I wish everyone who's like got their attitude so burrowed in like a, like a tick you know, could go out and travel and it would open up their hearts and mind. And then you would see like, oh my God, this thing, diversity, I'm not dealing with that. I'm over in their culture. Obviously I got to adopt. And then you learn something. We need diversity in this country. It's what has made us great. And we got to open our heart and move forward and keep being inclusive. I mean, that's what's going to keep us uh, ahead, hopefully uh, as a progressing society. So eyes open and be inclusive. Bill, uh, what can we do moving forward? What can people do? Uh, well, a little bit to follow up Chris's thing. I, I think being open to uh, you being the other, <laughs> you know, in new places, uh, cultures, uh, and social situ situations, uh, at least number one, gives you a little perspective. You know, often again, we live in a very rarefied, uh, you know, lily white area in some ways. And it is absolutely, and I'm sure Adrian can, uh, can relate to this. Uh, it is absolute certainty that I will probably be the only person of color in many, many gatherings around town and many little cocktail parties and things like that. Uh, that said, I think, you know, the way forward, and this is unfortunately uh, because now, you know, I'm thinking back to the before times, <laughs> before COVID, and we will have that you know, the epoch, it'll be a break in, you know, what we will be before and what we were after. Uh, but, you know, the small things is, okay, invite me to a party or out to dinner. And not because I'm a black person and not because you're on some quest, uh, just because you're like, oh, there's an interesting guy. Um, uh, and, you know, and maybe through, and unfortunately I'm one of these Oreos, I'm probably a little more white on the inside uh, they're not. I'm an old Jewish man, actually, uh, truth be told. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Thank you. I, I am. Um, and, uh, and even that's kind of enlightening when <laughs> you're talking about other things. And that kind of helps you uh, first appreciate, oh, he's not that different. You know, he's a schmuck like everybody else. <laughs> and also, he's uh, normal. Normal and regular human being. That's what I think, I, and then, you know, should, not that there's any talent, but should we able, be able to exchange some, you know, some meaningful social, cultural interactions, you know, kind of even better. But I think you'll actually find I'm way more like you than you would ever believe. Adrian, what can we do uh, moving forward? What can uh, all of us do? Well, I'm gonna say something that's uh, a little different here. I don't think we have to go too far here in, uh, in Wilton. I think that um, what a lot of people can do is um, when was the last time you uh, got the name of the person who's working on your yard or um, someone coming in to clean your home or um, someone who came to bring your food um, because you couldn't go out and get your groceries yourselves and and maybe introduced yourself to them and asked them their name and said hello. And, you know, if you're in the supermarket, how many of us know the names of the, the people who are working in the supermarket and, and really look to connect with them? And uh, so that's, that's, that's something really small. You don't have to really go too far for that. And just to, to see the um, humanity in these individuals and, you know, not they're not these people over there that you can you can you can treat them. You know, how are you treating your landscaper? How are you treating your mailman? Or how are you treating the one the the woman at the cashier at the at, at stop and shop or whatever? I think that's one thing we can do. The other thing um, 
if anyone on the school board is listening in this particular call, for years, I would say maybe 10 years, there was a program that I was very passionate about, the Underground Railroad, where I played um, Harriet Tubman. And for some reason, that program stopped. And I had a chance to talk to 300 kids each year to talk about helping them to see that we are more alike than we are different. And as a community, if we can bring some type of program back where we're able to speak into the lives of our children, we can make a difference. And so if there's anybody on the school board who is listening to that, that's one of the things I would say, bring back the Underground Railroad program for fifth graders that allowed the children to literally experience, it was an experiential program that allowed the children to experience what it felt like to be on the other side. And so when we can do things like that we, and help to change what our children are experiences, because I think many of us have already said we learn a lot from our children. I think that's something we need to look at as a community. That's a great suggestions. Other things you can do in your own home, you can read a book, you can go to a play, you can watch a movie, you can volunteer, you can make a new friend, start a conversation, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Um, there are, you can go to a, a support a cause, go to a peace march, um, donate your time and you can vote. So I want to thank all our panelists, uh, Chris, Kelly, Phil, Adrian, and, and she came right on time, uh, the <laughs> wonderful Elaine Tyloria. Um, thank you to the Wilton Library and to all the sponsors of this great program for making this possible and starting this conversation. I know we've run out of time, but if you'll bear with me, I just want to say really a special thank you for such a sincere, thoughtful and relevant discussion this evening. There is a coincidence that I must mention. The topic of race relations for Wilton Reads was selected about two years ago after we did the program on the Holocaust. It's incredible that this topic would be so relevant in this year and on this day. The panel talked about being on a journey of learning uh, about one's inner feelings and how we can grow from that. Um, I might say that on that journey, we meet people who make us better human beings. We also talked about Wilton as a jewel in Fairfield County. So I would like to take just a moment to recognize some of those Wiltonians who were trailblazers, such uh, people as Dave and Iola Brubeck, uh, Margaret Gregory, who was instrumental in Betty Jones's launch of her career into the world of opera. I would also like to commend those Wiltonians who are nurturing programs such as the ABC House. Uh, you know, indeed the title, subtitle of this program was The Way Forward and I'm so glad all of you had a chance to give some tips. And might I add just one, um, that on our individual journeys, each of us extend a welcoming gesture to those who don't look like us. Do it often as you can, because I'm sure you will feel better about yourself and you will also make someone feel better too. So again, many, many thanks to our terrific panelists and moderator this evening. Have a very good evening, everyone. Thank you so much.